And thank you, Jay and Ken. We have a great father who loves us, and he is perfect. And isn't it great that no matter where we may be in our lives and different struggles and times that just don't make sense, like losing um, a son at such a young age, that we can cry out to him and that he hears us and to know that he cares for us. My name is Aaron Varner. I have the great privilege of being a pastor here. If you're visiting with us, we're really glad that you're here. All of you who decided to come back, we're really excited to see all of you too. And uh, it's great to be in the house of the Lord and to sing praises to his name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, if you would open them up to Romans chapter 11, we're going to walk through Romans chapter 11 verses uh, 1 through 36. It's, uh, it's a challenge. Um, this isn't pity poor me time. This, it's just a challenge to walk through the book of Romans by itself, let alone trying to figure out how far and how fast at a time. Um, if I wanted to, I could really take a couple verses each week and we could be here for the next three years. Um, that's kind of not my plan. I think it's great. It's a great book. I think you need to study it and need to keep studying it even long after I pass over a whole chapter like I'm doing today. Uh, I do want to kind of give you a, a bigger uh, picture, uh, and part of this is looking at Romans 9 through 11 in this section and seeing how God is addressing, and we've been talking about this, God addressing um, his, his election, predestination, God's purposes and his plans and how they, how they interchange with man's choice and how those work together. If you understand them, there is something drastically wrong with you, okay? I, I love you and I care about you, but we cannot fathom how all of that goes together. And, and yet that tension, oftentimes we don't like tension in our life, and so we want to fix that tension. I'm one of those. I don't like tension. And so if there's ways that I can fix it, I'm going to go after it. But the truth is, I think God puts tension in our lives uh, to help us not just understand more, but to help us know that we, we can't know it all. To know that we can be okay in the tension of not fully being able to grasp this concept and yet still believe that it's true. It causes us to have to look at the character of God. Who is God? Who do I believe that he is? Not just how does he work. Or how does he allow me to work? But who is he? What, what, what's he made of? What's his essence? And so this morning we're going to continue that, Romans 11, as uh, we kind of address uh, this whole idea again about Israel and the Gentiles. And, and what has God done? Because we see in the Old Testament God has set aside this nation of people for himself. They're they're his people. He's claimed them by his name. And yet we're now here uh, some thousand years after Abraham. And, and, and here is Paul writing about God's people. And where are they? And what has God done with them? And again, it's addressing some of this. Is it God's fault or is it man's fault? We're going to look into that and dig into that in just a moment. Before we do, I want to pray. Before we pray, though, I do want to make note. Um, I do believe that Israel is still God's chosen people. God has not fulfilled all of his promises yet that he has given to the nation of Israel. But I believe he will one day. And with saying that, if you've taken note the last uh, two days, uh, a great, uh, a great, well, Devastation has taken place. And, and this morning, I think it fitting uh, that we are covering Romans 11, but that we also spend time praying for God's people, for the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, and that the hardening that Paul talks about in their heart here in Romans 11, that God would even use this time to soften their hearts, that they may see that Jesus is the Messiah, that they would claim Christ as their Savior, and that they would call out to God once again. So before we begin, would you stand with me and let's pray together. Lord, we, are, we believe that you are God of the universe. You are Lord over all. And yet you have chosen Israel as your people. 
and you have made great promises to them. We thank you that we can read from the scriptures of your truths and how you've called out a nation amongst all the other nations of the world. And Lord, you have chosen to work in and through them, through history and through the future. Lord, we want to lift up the nation of Israel this morning. We pray for your protection. We pray for your overseeing of them as your people. And there's been time in history past where you've allowed your nation of Israel to suffer persecution, to suffer hardship, to suffer the overthrow of, uh, of the, uh, and destruction of even of the temple and, and of their government. Lord, you have seen fit to do that in the past to help them to look to you. Lord, we pray, Lord, that through this time as a nation, as you've brought them back to some of the land that they now enjoy, Lord, that you would open the eyes and the hearts uh, of our Jewish friends, Lord, the Jewish people, that they would see their need for a Savior, Lord, that you would soften their hearts and their minds, and that they would accept Christ, Jesus Christ, as their Lord and as their King. Lord, we are grateful that we experience your blessing. And part of that is what we see here in Romans 11. We experience your grace and your mercy and your blessing because of the hardness of other people, the hardness of the heart of the Jewish people. We know one day you will restore your nation. And Lord, you will rule over them. Christ will in flesh will be here on this earth ruling over his people, the nation of Israel. And so we know that time is coming. We believe that time is coming soon. And so, Lord, as fellow Gentiles, Lord, may we see your mercy and may that motivate us to all the more be faithful to you, faithful in living our lives and faithful in speaking the truth of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. Thank you that we can cry out, as Jay sang for us, Abba, Father. Lord, as Paul wrote in Romans 8, Lord, we cry out to you, Daddy, Daddy, Father, Father, because you are not some far distance creator. You are a God who is close and near, who oversees us, who we can go to. And Lord, we're thankful that you love us that much. Bless our time as we open up your word. May your spirit move freely in our minds and hearts, and may we be changed because we've met with you today. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you would, stay standing and let's read Romans chapter 11 together, if you would. I'll be reading from the ESV. It'll be up on the screen, and you can follow along if you would. Paul writes, Romans 11, 1, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars. And I alone am left and they seek my life. But what was God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at this present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor and eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and ret a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, I am speaking to you Gentiles. 
Inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order that somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in amongst others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant towards the branches. If you, if you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the national branches, the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then that the kindness and the severity of God, severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in, your, in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted, contrary to nature, into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. But as regard the gospel, as regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedience to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so too they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a, a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. The first part of this section that we see here in Romans chapter 11 is this question. Um, and and it, what's interesting Paul writes, I ask then, it's kind of a change in how he's addressed uh, these uh, phantom, this phantom person before of asking these questions. So now it's him that's asking, right? I ask then, has God rejected his people? I'm going to ask for you because I know you have this question is essentially what he's saying. Um, has God rejected his people? No, in fact, these first six verses, he's going to address that. And ultimately, in these first six verses, he's going to say God is faithful. And he starts off talking about himself. He says, look at me. I, I, I'm an Israelite, right? I, I'm from, the, from Abraham, from the tribe of Benjamin. And, and he addresses the faithfulness of God that he, standing there as a Jewish person, person would be, uh, be saved, if God was not faithful to his people, then he wouldn't be there. And so his first example there is, listen, God's been faithful. I stand here testifying to you as one who is Jewish. And so then he continues. And he uh, says, God has not rejected his people, verse 2, whom he foreknew. Um, and then he, now he's going to talk about this story of Elijah. All right, he goes back 
to the prophet Elijah, and as Elijah is representing uh, God, there comes a point in time where Elijah is uh, in the wilderness and where he is so, uh, so discouraged, he feels like he's the only one left who loves God and who's devoted to him. And we see in 1 Kings chapter 9 or 19, uh, God addressing Elijah. And while uh, Elijah is there thinking he's all alone, God has reminded Elijah, listen, I have set aside, there are still 7,000 men who have not yet bowed their knee to Baal. There are 7,000 elect. There are 7,000, a remnant of Israel. While there may be great, a great amount of Israel, there, I have still kept a remnant who have trusted me, who had followed me. So Paul not only addresses God's faithfulness through his own salvation act, but also God's faithfulness even in the midst of times where it seems like none of the Jewish people are believing in him. He still has a remnant who continues that, and he shows that. He says, the elect obtain it. And again, don't let that scare you into thinking that God is just moving us around like pawns. No, he does give us choice. We see that throughout the scripture. And so we see these men and women choosing whether or not they will accept Christ, but also God choosing and electing his people and those who he foreknew, Ephesians 1, that, that he foreknew who would choose him. And so we see that while God was faithful, Israel failed to obtain what they were seeking. All right, verse 7 takes us in that next, uh, that next section. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. We saw earlier in this section, in, in, uh, in Romans 9, 10, 11, we saw in chapter 10 that, that here Israel was seeking a righteousness not by faith, but by their works. And, and, and Paul is reminding us here, what then has Israel failed? Uh, Israel failed to obtain what they were seeking. They were seeking this righteousness, but they failed because why? They didn't do it because of grace. They were doing it because of their works. And yet he says here in verse 7, the elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. I know there's a lot of question about, does God harden hearts? Well, the scripture says that, doesn't it? So if the Bible says that God hardens hearts, I have to believe it. Now, what does it mean? If God hardened Pharaoh's heart, was that because Pharaoh didn't have any choice? I believe, this is my own personal belief, that Pharaoh had opportunity to, to choose... All right, to do what was right, he chose to have a narrow mind. He chose to give into his own flesh. All right, Romans chapter 1 and 2, we've talked, we looked at this, how God at times has given man over to his own debased thinking. That hardening of our heart is already there, but when we get so set that this is what's right, we harden our heart. Is that God doing that or is it us doing that? I say, yes. Because I don't know. I don't know God's ultimate plan. And what we're going to see at the end of this chapter is, how do you know the ways of God? And ultimately we see, and again, this is where this comes together. There's a hardening amongst the people of Israel because God allowed it, but I think God brought it too. There's a purpose behind it. And God bringing this hardness, it brought salvation to the Gentiles. How do we make sense of that? Settle in the tension. It's okay. Be in the midst of that tension and just sit there. It's okay. All right, so we see here the elect attained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. So the elect attained it. Remember Elijah and these 7,000 men? But the rest were hardened, and he quotes from Isaiah 29.10 here, which he's going to quote from Isaiah quite a bit. 
part of it's because he's talking about Israel and the Jewish people would know Isaiah pretty well. So here is a man, ultimately, and David's going to address this in just a minute, but we see even today Jewish people have a trust in their place. And we're not so much different either as Gentiles. So let me, let me caution us there. But the Jews, believing that they are God's chosen people, at times have trusted in their own position, their own special privilege as, as God's people. And yet, oftentimes, they trust in that privilege without God and without acknowledging God. And we see that here, that God gave them this spirit, and he closed their eyes, and he closed their ears. Then we see him addressing this with a quote from David, a quote from Psalm 69, verse 22. See, the rest were hardened. How? Well, David says this in verse 9, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. If you dig into Psalm 69, you see there's some, uh, some messianic tones here, meaning it's talking about Christ and his suffering that he has, uh, that he would take as David wrote the persecution and the hardship that's, that the David talks about in Psalm 69, addressing the Messiah. And yet, here's this section of talking about the table. You see the table, and it takes me back, and one of the commentaries that I read addressed this. It's a really fascinating study that maybe you jump into a little bit. But you think about Jesus as he, as he sat at the table with his disciples. And yet, we know one of them who sat there was Judas, and yet this table became a stumbling block. Fast forward a little bit. You go to Corinthians and Paul's addressing communion. And once again, coming to the communion table with, with, with the church. And what are they doing? The, the table's getting in the way of what their faith should be focused upon. And so we see that here, even amongst those of God's own people, the table it's become a snare. John 13, 21 through 30 is a great passage that you could look up and you can study and, and, and see how even there, there was Judas. Paul goes to this next question, just like he did in verse 1. So now he asks in verse 11, so I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? Meaning this, he, he, what he's saying, has Israel stumbled in order that they would turn away forever? Would they stumble upon that table, the ultimate gift that Christ became, and that would Israel be turned away? Would they be neglected forever? He answers this very emphatically, by no means. No, they're not turned away forever. Rather, through their trespass, what's a trespass? It's a sin, right? Through their sin, through their hardness of their heart, their rejection of God, and more specifically of Christ, because of their, their rejection of Jesus Christ, salvation has come to who? To Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. You may ask, why would God want to make people jealous? For his glory, so that they would look to him. Right? Here he is, and he offers salvation because of Israel's rejection. Verse 12 says, now if their trespass means riches for the world. What are the riches? It's not monetary. It's not obtaining more things. No, this is salvation. Because the world now gets to experience and to have this message of becoming a child of God. And if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? 
Paul's going to, con- going to continue not only here, but in just a couple verses, he's going to remind us God hasn't rejected Israel forever, but there's a period in time, a period in time because of the hardness of their heart, the gospel message is open to the whole world to come and to be God's people, to come and be God's children. The church does not replace Israel. Don't do that. Don't read into the text that Israel and the church are together. All right? Some of the blessings we share, yes. But are we going to have the land that Israel was promised? No. That's not for us. The promises that were made to Israel were for Israel. That's why we have to be careful not to read into the text out of context. But what we see here is for this period of time where the hardness of heart has happened of Israel, the salvation message has gone out into the world, and now the Gentiles, we get to experience that blessing. But he says here, don't forget. It's like he's reminding us how much more will their fulfillment uh, or full inclusion mean. While this is great that we get to experience this, how much greater it will be when Israel is included back in. And then he goes on, now I'm speaking to you Gentiles. Whereas before he's speaking to the Jewish nation, now he's being very specific. I want to caution us here. There are some who will take this text and where you will start to take uh, and read yourself into the text here. I think that Paul is addressing the full Gentiles as a whole here. I do not think he's talking to the church individually. I do not think he's talking to those Gentiles who have accepted Jesus. I think he's talking on the whole. Why do I say that? Because I believe there are other texts that tell us that we can never lose our salvation. And there are some who will read into the text that we're going to cover about the branches being cut off or thrown in where you could possibly lose your salvation if you don't have enough fear. We're going to look at it here in just a moment, but I'm trying to address it in the beginning. When he's talking to the Gentiles, this is a term Gentilian, that he's looking at the fullness of the Gentilian people. All right? And so I, that's what I believe, and I think it will help us as we walk through this, and I hope that you can see that too. So I'm now speaking to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. Why is Paul speaking to the Gentiles? What gives him the authority? He just said he was Jewish. Well, he has a calling. God has sent him to come speak to the Gentiles. And he says, I magnify my ministry. All right. I I proclaim this. I bring this ministry in order that somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. Paul's already addressed his desire for his people, his brothers and sisters, his Jewish friends, that they would come to acknowledge Jesus and to be saved. He has this agony for them, and yet he is sharing. Part of why I'm sharing the gospel message with the Gentiles is so that my brothers over here may see and be jealous and see what they're missing, to see your life, to see what Jesus has done in you, that they would, that they would question that. He said, that's why I've been called. That's why I'm, that's why I'm sharing with you. And he, so he says... Uh, Addressing this, this, this jealousy, for if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? He knows they're dead. He wants them to be alive. And yet, he talks about this and gives this illustration about dough, right? In verse 16, if dough is offered as first fruits is holy, that, that first part of the dough pinch off a little bit of the dough and it's offered, right, as holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And so here he is addressing this idea, not that the Gentiles are so much better than his Jewish people, but he is desiring his Jewish uh, friends that they may see their need for a Savior because the Gentiles have obtained this faith. They're living out this faith. He says, I don't want you to be arrogant, but I want you to see while it's great now, how much greater it will be when Israel is included, when we see the fulfillment. Why? Because we see the fulfillment of God's promises. 
The promises that he has promised Israel have that, that have not yet come true, but will come true because God is faithful to his word. How much greater will that be for us? Verse 17. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in amongst others, and now share in the nurturing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. This is part of why I'm saying this. I believe this is the Gentilian overview. We as Gentiles, we've been given this gift. We've been able to be grafted in to a, 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 a nurturing olive tree, that root is holy. We know that root is ultimately God. And John talks about this in his gospel. We've been grafted into this tree as an outsider, a wild olive tree. Now we've been given this beautiful gift. How did we get here? Well, yes, yeah, some branches were cut off so that we could go in. But don't become arrogant, he says. Don't think that you've arrived. I sense in our world today, sometimes, even as Americans, we've got this entitlement. God has not promised to work through the United States of America. Nowhere in here does he say that. Do you know what nation he has promised to work through? Israel. It does not mean that we should turn our backs upon God as a nation. When you read and study history, true history, not Google history, and not some of the junk that they're teaching today, you will see the history of how our nation was founded. And for that, as fellow partakers of the grace and mercy of God, we should rejoice. And we should want that. We should desire that as a nation for our children and for our grandchildren. Because we see the mercy of God. We see God's grace upon us. But God in his choosing may not allow the United States of America to continue to be a nation under him. We should pray for that. We should be earnest in our thinking and our belief, biblical worldview belief, and how we vote and what we do. God's given us those privileges. But do not mistake the promises that God has given to us as his children and the promises that God has given to his nation of Israel as the same promises that he has given to the United States of America. Don't make the Bible say something that it doesn't say. Don't stand for something that may not be part of God's will. Do we pray for God's revival? We should. You should. I should. I am there are times in history where it seems very dark. And yet when God's people prayed, God was merciful. And he revived a nation or a group of people and brought them back to him. Sorry, got off on my soapbox. It is critical as we see here though, this idea as a Gentile uh, as Gentiles, that we not become arrogant and think that we've arrived. We've arrived, and Paul says this, because of God's grace. And it can be, and it will be taken away if we fail to acknowledge him. And so we continue. He says, don't be arrogant, verse 18, don't be arrogant towards the branches. 
If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you, verse 19. Then you will say branches are broken off so that we might be grafted in. While that's true, they were broken off because of their what? Their unbelief. But you stand fast through what? Faith. We walk by faith. So do not become proud, but fear. We fear today as Gentilians because people are rejecting that. They're rejecting Christ. They're rejecting what it means to acknowledge him. Verse 21, for if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. First, the severity towards those who have fallen. It's those who have been cut off. Those branches that have been cut and thrown away. But God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. There's a continuation that needs to be going on. This isn't just for us for as believers. Again, it's not because we should be fearful of losing our salvation that, oh, I got to continue to fear God and be in his kindness. No, we, we fear God in a holiness way because he is almighty and he's big and he's great and he should be at that all in our life. But we continue in his kindness. And he says here in verse 22, the end of it, otherwise you too will be cut off. If Gentiles cease to see the kindness of God, they will be cut off. Verse 23. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. He's talking about the Jewish people. While those who are Gentiles, if they reject the kindness of God and no longer live by faith, they're going to be cut off. But he gives the other side of it. And even though these branches that have been cut off and the Jewish people, those who, if they continue, if they, if they change in their unbelief, they do not continue in their unbelief. Meaning if they start to believe, they believe in the Christ, they will be grafted in again. And we've seen some of our Jewish friends who have come to know Christ. Showing the faithfulness of God. Again, there's always going to be a remnant of Israel. It's a blessing of God. It shows the faithfulness of God's word. Verse 24. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? Listen, Israel is going to be restored back one day. That's what Paul is addressing. He's been saying it. This is now the third time. How much more in their inclusion, he has said earlier. Now he's saying, listen, they're naturally an olive tree, right? Not a wild one, but a cultivated one. How easy will it be for them to come back then? Verse 25. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery. What mystery? What he's just talked about. The fact that there is, there will be these natural branches grafted back into this olive tree. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved as it is written. When we stop and see here, verse 25... All right, there's a partial hardening. Not all Israel is hardened. All right, not all Jewish people uh, have, have rejected Jesus. We see that today. There are some who believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. But there's a partial hardening. And in the midst of that, that's taking place so that the fullness of the Gentile time may happen. So that as God... And as he uses us as his instruments, proclaim the gospel across the globe. There is a time for Gentiles to accept and believe Jesus Christ. There is that time. There's a period and until that fullness happens. That's the day and age where we live. We're living here today at this time. There will be a time where that ends, though. And when that happens, verse 26 in this way, all Israel will be saved. 
So now Paul is going to talk about the future. He's going to talk about how Israel is saved. And in doing this, he quotes from Isaiah 59. While there is a hardening upon the Jewish people, partial until the fullness of Gentiles has come, the election, then the rapture, I believe, the Bible tells us, then the rapture will take place. There's judgment, and then we see Christ's rule and reign as Israel's king. This is called the millennium period, a thousand-year reign, where, as we see, as we're going to see here, his mercy is upon all. In verse 32, let's see what Isaiah writes. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. I believe the rapture is where God takes his church during this church age home. And then we see, we'll see the judgment poured out. Jesus tells us, Matthew records for us, the judgments upon Israel and upon uh, the world. We see part of that in the book of Revelation. In the tribulation during those, those seven horrible and awful years. And then we see Christ coming and Christ coming to deal with who? His nation. His people. While there is a partial hardening now, Jesus is coming to save his people again. Isaiah talks about it, and here Paul uses it. Verse 28. As regards to the gospel, or the good news, they are enemies for your sake. <laughs> I love how Paul says this. Like Israel is kind of like your enemies for the gospel. Because why? Because they rejected it, you get it. If they would not have rejected it, would you have gotten that? He doesn't address that. We don't have to go down that what-if story. The truth is, the way we see Israel is almost like they're our enemies for the gospel's sake. But they're not really our enemies. He doesn't want us to have that kind of view. They are beloved for the sake of our forefathers in regards to election. They're elected. We're elected. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. That's a term that means it's not regretful. It's, it's nothing to feel sorry about. We don't feel sorry about the gifts and the calling of God. We shouldn't feel regretful that God has opened up salvation for us, nor that he has hardened some of Israel's hearts right now. Nor should we feel bad because what is coming? For just as... You were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience. So they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. They're no different than you. You were disobedient. God saved you because of his mercy. They rejected him. You accepted, and because of that, they see his mercy. Thus, his mercy will be poured out on them as well. I love how Paul finishes this whole section. For God, verse 32, for God has consigned all to disobedience. Meaning, he has imprisoned, or he has confined it's, it's this idea that you throw a net over the fish and it entraps them in it. There's no way to get out. We've read that. Paul's talked about that. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is no one who does good. No, not one. And here Paul says God has consigned all to disobedience. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter. But notice what, what he finishes this verse, that he may have what? Mercy on all. This isn't just that one group of people are better than the other people. It's not because they have something to offer, that they've done great things and these people have done worse things. No, God has shown that all are disobedient. And yet he has had mercy on all. 
Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. Maybe you need to pause and maybe you need to memorize that section of that verse. Maybe you just need to take that with you this week. And to ponder and to think about that. The depth of his riches and wisdom and knowledge. Because he's going to address how we think. How unsearchable are his judgments. You're going to question God's judgment. You're going to question whether he is just and fair and right. How unsearchable, meaning how unfathomable, we can't even comprehend are his judgments. And how unscrutable, for it is impossible for us to understand his ways. That's my God. He's that big. And when you think... Sorry, I don't want to be like attacking with the sword. When we think that we can fully understand all of God's ways, come back to the text. God is merciful. He is just and he is right. His riches and his wisdom and his knowledge is so big that I cannot fully fathom it. And in that tension... I'm okay with it. He then says this. He quotes. For who has known the mind of the Lord. Or who has been his counselor. Are you a counselor. To God. You've known his mind. And so you're going to give him counsel. And then he says this. Or who has given a gift to him. That he might repay it. What do you have to offer to God where God should look upon you and say, oh, because you gave me that, I'll repay you. We play those games at times, though, don't we? Here's two verses of the Old Testament that I think Paul takes these two concepts from. The first is Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. I think I have it for us up there. Thanks. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. And then next, Isaiah 40, verses 13 and 14. Who has the measure of the spirit of the Lord? Who's measured the spirit? Or what man shows him his counsel? Can I just stop for a second? When we get to Christmas in just a few weeks, and I know that's scary for some of you, but we'll get there. In just a few weeks, we're going to sing and we're going to hear about Jesus coming as the Prince of Peace, the mighty counselor. And yet, here we are giving counsel to the counselor. Just something that I thought of as I read this. Whom did he consult? And who made him understand? Did you make God understand? Who taught him the path of justice? And who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Thus, when Paul addresses and finishes this section, he says this in Romans eleven thirty six: For from him and through him and to him are all things. Of him, that God is the source. Through him, he is the worker and sustainer. And unto him, for him, he has the right highest place. That's our God. Who is he that we could catch a glimpse and understand how great and how awesome he is? Oftentimes we think that we are the creator of something or we invent something. No, we're users and we're discoverers. We've not created anything. God has created it all. And to him be the glory 
forever. So how do we live this out? God's inscrutable ways, his ways that seem impossible to understand. The biggest concept that we can take away from this is first for us to understand that we are the divine objects of his mercy. We are the objects of his mercy that he continues to show upon us. That he would allow us to grasp hold of the concept that he would send his son and he would die for you and me. That we were in such need that we couldn't save ourselves, but that Jesus Christ would give his life so that we could have life forever with him. God chose us to be objects of his divine mercy, just as he chose Israel and will show that mercy in the future to them. So he is showing to us during this time, the time of the Gentiles. So, With that big idea comes this reminder. Don't claim anything for yourself. That's arrogance and that's pride. Salvation is a gift of God's grace. See, we are objects of his mercy. We were all, what does it say? Consigned to disobedience. We were helpless and hopeless. Some of you need reminded of that today. Some of you need to be reminded of the goodness of God though today. To not stay in that pit. It isn't a pit to stay in. And in fact, we claim this truth as the foundation of how we live our lives. The fact that God has given us and shown divine grace upon us helps us to live for him this week. I will make choices this week to obey him or disobey him, to take him at his word or to not take him at his word, to trust by faith or to want to see and demand that I walk by sight. What's the foundation that we see here that Paul brings us back to? Ultimately, it's God who has shown mercy upon you and me. Are you thankful for that? It should change us. Because as we've been seeing here, we realize how little we are. Back in the late 1700s, it's a story about Sir Isaac Newton. And Sir Isaac Newton was uh, a a great man of God by what we read. And he was doing a study, uh, a study through Job and also through some of the Gospels. As he was going through his study, he, uh, he made a proclamation. Sir Isaac Newton made a proclamation that one day human beings would be able to travel 50 miles an hour. Now, don't laugh. Come on now. He made that proclamation. And uh, there was a response and a rebuttal to that to think how foolish it would be that man could do that. And yet, in the midst of that, there was uh, this argument. And uh, uh, Voltaire, he was a French infidel in the 18th century, um, he speaks of Sir Isaac Newton, and, uh, and yet he, he says, oh, this poor man. What's interesting is this whole idea and concept that, that here something for you and for me to hear going 50 miles an hour, right? Like, that's no big deal. Some of you will do that on your way home on the highway, right? Mm-hmm. But it proved and it showed me again in 1776. How far have we come in our understanding and our knowledge? But how little do we still not understand? Voltaire uh, got on Sir Isaac Newton, but what was what's really humorous for me is in that same office where Voltaire had made this statement, uh, it became uh, the the royal 
uh, Bible society. His very office where he was would later years become the office of the Bible society that would spread millions and millions of the gospel message around the globe. Amazing God in his sense of humor. But it should be a reminder to us. Be careful. How unsearchable are God's ways. His judgments and how inscrutable are his ways. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the way you care for us. Thank you for the gospel message that you've given to us through Christ. We are reminded again here today that we sit here as children, as followers of God, not because we have anything to offer to you, we stand and we sing and we sit and we listen because of your divine mercy that's been poured out upon us. Your mercy that was exhibited in the grace of your son. The gift that was given to us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ would die for us. We have the capacity today to love, not because we've conjured it up in ourselves we love because you first loved us it's a continual need for us to be reminded so that we don't become full of ourselves we don't become conceited or arrogant Thinking that our position is one that, uh, that is above everyone else and where we leave you out and where we put ourselves on the throne. And so, Lord, we come asking for your forgiveness in the times that we've done that. In the times as individuals, as a church, and as a nation. To think that we know what's best. To think that we know how to obtain exactly what is needed without your help. We are sorry. We ask for your forgiveness for that arrogance. When we see our position as more important than seeing Jesus. Lord, we are grateful for your mercy. And Lord, my prayer today is that it would motivate us. It would motivate us and encourage us to live faithfully today. To be faithful tomorrow. We don't know how much longer this time of Gentiles is. We pray that you would help us to be faithful during this time so that your name would be magnified and praised. So that you would be glorified and so that others may see your goodness and your grace through us. Thank you. That we can join here and now that we can sing our voices in deep appreciation and a deep love and thankfulness for who you are and what you've given to us. We pray this in the name of Jesus.